I'm delighted that y'all are here. I'm Ron Bailey. I'm the science correspondent uh, for Reason Magazine. And I'm going to be giving a talk that I've called the, the End of Doom, which is the title, the working title of a book of mine that I'm still working on. Kind of give you a preview of some of the things I'll be talking about in that book. I'm starting with this particular slide, which is the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, uh, which is part of the, the Christian mythology. And what this t can be translated as is pestilence, war, famine, and death. And it turns out that all four of those are being reduced in the modern age. Pestilence is way down. War is also way down. You have probably less chance of being killed in a violent conflict uh, today than you would have had in any other time in all of human history. Famine is way down. We'll get a bit talking about that, but uh, there are the, the lowest percentage of people on the planet are malnourished than ever before in history. And even death is way down. It's still inevitable, but it is way down. Basically, human life uh, expectancy has increased from an average of 47 years in 1955 to 70 years today. So what I would like to talk about, what I'm organizing is what I'm calling the four horsemen of the modern abundance. Uh, we're calling it peak population, peak farmland, peak pollution, and peak nothing. We'll get to that one in a minute. So this is what overpopulation looks like. This is the face of overpopulation. This is Paul Ehrlich, who wrote The Population Bomb in 1968. And he said, the battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s, the world will undergo famines. Hundreds of millions of people are going to starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. Well, that didn't happen. So this is Paul Ehrlich today. And this he just published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society uh, uh, earlier this year. The human predicament is driven by overpopulation, overconsumption of natural resources, and, of, uh, and the use of, of unnecessarily environmentally damaging technologies and socioeconomic political arrangements to service homo sapiens, aggregate consumption. By the way, the socioeconomic political arrangement that he's speaking of, it becomes clear in the article, is democratic capitalism. He thinks that's just a terrible way to organize the world. So he's still predicting doom. But what's happening, actually? Here's a chart showing what is happening to total fertility trends. Total fertility is basically the average number of children that the average woman is expected to have over the course of her life. And it's been collapsing, and it's been falling. It, in 1960, it was around 5.5 children per woman over the course of her life. It is down to 2.4, and it's collapsing in all the regions of the world. Uh, this is the latest data or projections, I should say, out of the United Nations. Every two years, they do what they call a, a population revision. And this particular one, they give you a medium, a constant fertility, a high, and a low trajectory that, that, that population could go. Now, the difference between the high and the low is essentially one child over the, over the next 60 years or so. Uh, now, the question is, which trajectory would, is, will, is it likely to go on? The, typically, people t take the median as the, the mo most likely, though that hasn't historically been proven to be the case. And if that were to be the case, by the end of this century, uh, global population will have increased up to a little over 10 billion people. You'll notice it will not have doubled again. We, most of us in this room have lived through the last human population doubling and that will ever occur again. But the lower trajectory is, has been the one that seems to be the more likely one over the past few years. So what is going on? Well, I'd like to give you three reasons to expect the lower trajectory. One is this particular thing, total fertility and GDP per capita. What you find is over here in, at the top end, where uh, women are still having uh, five, six, and seven kids, they're having incomes below $1,000, below $500 per capita. And then what you see as you go out to get to 25, dollars $20,000, $30,000, the fertility is below 2.1 children, which is replacement. The world is going to get wealthier over the course of the 21st century, and that particular dynamic will continue to go. Now, there's another piece of data that I, that I don't have here, but there's some wonderful work that's been done by some anthropologists recently at the University of Michigan and, and at the University of Connecticut, where what they've done, they've looked at uh, women's life expectancy. And it turns out that if women can expect to live only up to age 60, they have five children on average. But when they, get to, when they can expect to live to over 75, it falls to 1.5 children over their lives. So what is, what is happening is, to a certain extent, 
these anthropologists think there's a kind of natural history of reproduction. If you don't think you're going to be around, you have a lot more kids because you're living in a violent, chaotic, poor place, and you want some of your kids to survive, so you have more kids. And with, if, where, if you think you can live to 75 or so, instead of having more kids, you have fewer and invest more resources in them. And that is how you change the way you, if you will, uh, reproduce. The other um, interesting statistic was done by uh, an economist at Wheaton College called Seth Norton. He was, I wanted to do this myself, and when I came across this study, I was like, ah, damn. He basically did a correlation between economic freedom and rule of law and the number of children over the time uh, that, that uh, each, each society has. I don't think it'll shock this particular audience, but if your uh, rule of law quotient was low or your economic freedom quotient was low, again, the average was five children per woman. On the other hand, if you were high, it was below two children per woman. So again, these three things all go together. Longer life expectancy, greater wealth, and greater freedom will all tend to go on that lower trajectory of population growth over the rest of the century. Whoops, I've got to point at that. And I, I tend to agree with this. This was a statement that was just made by Sanjeev Sanyal, who works at Deutsche Bank, and it was just published uh, uh, less than a month ago. And I think he's right. In our view, global fertility will fall to replacement rate in less than 15 years. That is, from 2.4 today to less than 2.1 in 15 years globally, and will peak at 8.7 and go down to 8 billion. I think it's going to be even lower than that, but we'll see. Uh, who is Norman Borlaug? The fellow who did the new crops. He was the father of the Green Revolution. That is correct. He is the person who has probably saved more human lives than any single human being in all of human history and is a great hero and a great friend of reasons that when he was alive. So peak farmland is one of the other forces of abundance that I'm talking about. This is Jesse Ausable, who works at Rockefeller University in the Human Environment Program. He's the director of it. And they just had an article in Population Development Review where they've calculated what's happening with farmland all around the globe. And their conclusion is, that humanity now stands at peak farmland and, and the 21st century will see the release of vast areas of land, hundreds of millions of hectares, more than twice the area of France for nature. Agriculture is becoming so productive that we will be able to return millions of acres of land back to nature over the course of this century. So how is this working? Well, as you can see, unlike Paul Ehrlich, the famine claimed the famines didn't occur and they didn't occur because what you see is that corn, wheat, and rice all essentially tripled in, in productivity over the last uh, uh, 50 years or so. And I should point out that, that, that while they tripled, the amount of food that was available to people tripled, the population only doubled. So the amount of calories per capita that the world has has increased enormously, which is why starvation has declined so, so significantly. And so this is another way of looking at it. If we had maintained the same crop productivity that we had in 1960 until today and tried to feed the world's population that exists today, about 7.2 uh, billion people, what would have happened is we would have had to plow down an additional 3 billion acres of land to do that. Now, how much is that? Skinhead Earth is the way that Jesse Ausubel refers to it. If crop yields had remained stuck in 1960 levels, the world would have needed another 3 billion acre, hectares I'm sorry, to feed uh, the current population. About the sum of the USA, Canada, and China are almost twice of South America. That would have been ec uh, ecologically and environmentally very bad. But that's not what happened. So another side of, of crop productivity is reforestation. Again, more land returning to nature. And this is uh, from research that was published in 2006 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences where basically they surveyed the 50, country, the 50 largest countries, the 50 countries with the largest amounts of forest land in the world, and found that in fact, that when you got to per capita incomes of $4,600, that basically the forests stop being reduced and they start regrowing again. This is something called the environmental Kuznets curve, which we'll get to momentarily. There is, I wanted to give one caveat though with this. One of the problems with the forests around the world is 88% of the world's forests are owned by governments. And that has its own problems, shall we say. But anyway, I mentioned the environmental Kuznets curve. And the idea here is, is that as people get 
start developing, as they start trying to, to, get, to feed their families better, get better housing, uh, create the wherewithal for, for uh, a better life, the environment decays. They, they care a lot less about pollution at that point, for example, be, uh, rather than, than feed their families. So the trade-off they're making is more pollution uh, so that I can get more goods and services for my family. But at a turning point, when incomes get to a certain level, what happens is we find, and there's a huge amount of literature supporting this, is that uh, people say, you know, it's really too polluted around here. I would really like to have some forests to go visit. So, so they start investing uh, in environmental improvement. And so what you have, as I mentioned before, the reforestation, that is one of the Kuznets curves. That $4,600 uh, $4, per capita, you find reforestation returning. And this happens a lot in a lot of areas of environmental problems. So let's talk about peak pollution, which is what I mentioned. Now this is a complicated chart, but bear with me a little bit. This is from the Environmental Protection Agency. I did not make this stuff up. They produce it. You can go and look it for yourself. And what you find is, is that U.S. wealth population pollution trends between 1970 and 2008. The economy more than doubled in size. The amount of, of, of miles that we drove our cars and trucks and so forth uh, went over, increased by 160%. The population increased by 50 percent. The uh, energy consumption increased by 50 percent. And uh, the carbon emissions, carbon dioxide emissions, also increased almost 50 percent. But at the bottom there, that little line going to the bottom, air pollution, the six, the six pollutants that are basically regulated by the, our government, declined at, in aggregate by 60 percent. We got much wealthier and pollution went way down. And I have to say, my first time coming out to LA as a much younger man, I used to not see the mountains. I see them all the time now. There has been significant progress in that area. Now, what to the vexed question of global warming. Uh, I, I was discussing uh, over, over lunch, I basically consider myself sort of a lukewarmer. I'll explain that in a little bit. <laughs> But here we have, uh, what I've tried to do is to show you what the actual trends are. These are satellite and surface temperature trends from 1979 to 2013. And there are basically um, three different surface data sets that have been uh, gathered from around the world, and then there are two satellite data sets that, that are used over time. And what you find is, and this is smoothed for, I believe, a five-year average, and what you find is uh, there has been an increase since 1979. The latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that came out less than a month ago, uh, the physical sciences report, uh, concluded that the temperature has risen since the 1950s for, by about 6 degrees, 0.6 degrees, I'm sorry, 0.6 degrees Celsius over that period of time, and that, which suggests that a per decade increase of temperature of 0 0.12 degrees per decade over that time. Interestingly enough, they even admitted in that report that the temperature of the planet, the average temperature, again, has not actually increased very much, if at all, over the last 15 years. They are very confident, the people at the UN, are very confident that the results of their climate change models are predicting significant warming to, for the remainder of, of, the, uh, of, the, of this century, significant and problematic warming. And so in the latest uh, IPCC report, they give this chart where they're trying to show how accurately their models follow along with the temperature observations. And what you find is, and it's a little bit hard to see, but essentially what you find is here a little line uh, in the middle of 73 model realizations, as they call them. And it looks like it's a, not a terrible, it's a pretty good fit. It's kind of toward the low end. But is that what's going on? There are a lot of people who are critiquing this. And one of my favorite guys is a guy named John Christie, who is a climatologist at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. And he and his colleague, Roy Spencer, have been measuring the temperature of the globe using satellites since 1979. And they've been doing this for, uh, they're, they're very significant, very important, very uh, well-respected climatologists. And what he did was take those 73 models, various realizations of them, for the tropical troposphere. Now you would expect, as it turns out, and I won't go into great detail, you would expect the warming to be most easily detected in the tropical troposphere. And what he finds instead is you see the black line, that's the average of that. And at the bottom there you have the two satellite records that are run there 
plus several weather balloons. Those are those little blue and green things. And what you see is none of the models actually reproduce those observations. They're, run they're all running much too hot. And another way to look at this is he just takes those averages and you'll see there's a considerable divergence. So the IPCC people acknowledge that there has been a quote unquote hiatus in the warming and they are very confident their models are right and in the next five years or so the warming should resume and it should go very much faster. If it doesn't, there's going to be a big problem with the uh, science. What about peak everything? We're running out of everything, aren't we? This is what you hear all the time. I'm calling this section peak nothing. Um, I think this is the right question that we should ask ourselves all the time. These are two economists, European economists, in an article in 2003 where they asked the following question. Is it realistic to predict that knowledge accumulation is so powerful as to outweigh the physical limits of physical capital services and the limited substitution possibilities of natural resources. Basically, are human beings smart enough to overcome scarcities through their intellectual powers? And the answer is, I think, yes. Let's go to peak oil, which I don't hear anything about peak oil anymore. It's kind of just gone away. But six years ago, it was all over the place. And this was a CNN report from a group in Germany called Energy Watch Group, whose uh, slogan, by the way, is because energy needs objective information. They predicted, and you can see here that, uh, that this little chart I've embedded there is their predictions of where oil is going to peak in various regions of the world. But this is it. It supposedly peaked in 2006 and was going to go down 3% a year for the, for the rest of, the, of, uh, of eternity, probably. And so we would only have half of as much oil as uh, it's by 2030s we're currently producing. That didn't happen. In fact, uh, Leonardo Mogheri, who is at Harvard's Belfer Center, he used to be a, an, an executive at the Italian energy company, Eni. And he has done an analysis where he believes that there's a global oil glut coming. Global oil output capacity is likely to grow from 93 million barrels per day today, per day today to 110 million barrels per day by 2020, the largest increase in a single decade since the 1980s. Ah, the limits to growth. Now this is where we got the peak everything meme, I would suggest, years and years ago, back in 1972. The limits to growth basically was a, a series of a computer model that was predicting all kinds of horrible things about uh, the collapse of civilization because we were going to run out of non-renewable resources. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but today is the 40th anniversary of the oil crisis. This was the day that OPEC said, we're not going to send you any oil. And so this book seemed to get some resonance out of that, that particular fact. In any case, uh, this on the side here, they said that known reserves of these non-renewable resources would mostly be gone by the year 2000. And they gave various dates. Now, to be honest and to be fair, they also said, let's assume that there are five times more than we expected uh, the, to be reserves. Even if you crunch those numbers, at the, at the exponential growth rates they expected the economy to grow at, and they're used to be going, we would already be running out of many of these resources anyway. So what happened? Uh, you can go to the U.S. Geological Survey and you can find out how many reserves we still have. And as you can see, the reserves are still much higher uh, some more than uh, 40 years later after, the, uh, after the, the limits to growth was published. Now, this particular fellow that I have over here is wearing the uh, devil's horns is a favorite economist of mine, unfortunately dead, uh, named Julian Simon, mm -hmm. who wrote a fabulous book on the ultimate resource, which is human beings, among many other things. And he very famously had a bet with Paul Ehrlich back in between 1980 uh, and 1990 where Paul Ehrlich and his buddies got to pick uh, a, a market basket of, of five metals, and the bet was is that um, it cost $1,000 in 1980, and, uh, and Simon bet that the prices would go down, and therefore if they did go down, Ehrlich would have to pay him the difference uh, from going down to 1000 or if they go up, then Simon, uh, Simon would have to pay Ehrlich the additional amount over $1,000. <coughs> In 1990, Ehrlich sent a check without a note, I might add, for 
to Simon. In other words, the prices of that basket of metals went down by more than 50% over that period of time. Um, I should say there is another analysis. Prices have been going up re recently. And there's another analysis by an economist named uh, Sachs, which we could talk about, which suggests that there are super cycles in uh, minerals and so forth. And basically what happens is, is that prices go up, human ingenuity is applied, and the prices go back down. And he thinks we're at the turning point of this latest super cycle. That, that's still debatable. In any case, I'd like to suggest to you that doom has been postponed again. And, uh, and, and the world is likely to be, become a much better place over the course of the remainder of this century. Anyway, thank you very much for paying attention to me. I would love to hear any questions you might have.